Part two. Um, I guess I should stop and ask. Well, I probably actually should have planned to go over this today. The final writing assignment. Um, let me see if there's anything I need to say about that, or if you guys have any questions about it. So this is different than the other two assignments, right? This is like a paper. So it has like a thesis and conclusion and all that stuff. <laughs> um, and there's uh, suggested topics, but the suggested topics are pretty open-ended. They have a lot of different ways you could go, different sub-questions. Um, so, So, um, so in other words, the, the, you know, there's a lot of like different sub questions and whatever in each of these. That doesn't mean you're supposed to answer each one of them. They're just they're just different suggestions for how you might go. Um, and uh, um, Yeah, uh, I'm not expecting you or even necessarily recommending that you bring in outside material besides the text that we read, but if you do, obviously you have to cite it. <laughs> um, uh, and um, I mean, I don't care how you cite things, just as long as it's clear enough that I could find the source of the format. Um, and Yeah, I mean, so people have had courses with me. I don't remember. I think some of you have had courses with me before. Yeah. 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 yeah, so it's, I mean, this is kind of similar in my other assignments, but, you know, that uh, all the topics require you to make substantial use of material from at least two of the main authors or from at least two different works by the same author. So, in other words, they're like comparison topics, basically. Um, which I think is easier to write a good paper about than a straight out. Like, in other words, you, what does Nietzsche mean? <laughs> well, it's like, in what way is Nietzsche similar to Emerson? Or, you know, whatever, like that's easier to say something reasonable and interesting about. It. Um, uh, and also their interpretive papers. So, like, basically, the idea is to try to say something about what the authors mean. Um, <clears throat> as opposed to, like, deciding whether the authors are right. <laughs> For example. I mean, I don't know if that would even be tempting with most of these authors, but maybe it would. But I don't know. But anyway, like, you know, again, writing a critique of Nietzsche well would be a lot harder than writing something about what Nietzsche means well. I mean, it, it kind of had to include writing something good about what Nietzsche means and <laughs> something else. So, uh, uh, okay. I think those are the main points of this. Are there any questions about that? Yeah, I'm, I don't know if I'll have the second writing assignment. I, I hope since next week I won't be teaching that I'll be able to get to that really quickly. But there's a bunch of other stuff that's also piling up, like the recommendation <laughs> kinds of stuff. But anyway, yeah, so uh, hopefully I can have the second writing assignment back to you before you have to have this one in. But I mean, it shouldn't make that much difference. Um, um, and yeah, I mean, I don't grade based on whether, I also don't grade based on whether I think you're right. 
<laughs> right? But I mean, but there's there's something kind of close to that, which is like, are you seriously interpreting the text? So I mean, you can be seriously interpreting the text and come to a really different conclusion than I do, and I can still think you're wrong and say, well, that's interesting. But like, if it seems that like you know. Uh, you're just taking pieces of that out of context and making it say something it doesn't say, or you know, that would be bad. Uh, okay, are there questions about that? Okay, back to Nietzsche then. All right, so, okay, so Zarathustra is coming. The part two starts with Zarathustra coming down from the mountain for the second time. Um, at some point, last time I lectured about this, I ended up drawing a whole graph of what's going on. Going back down. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, maybe maybe that's still I'm, I'll still end up doing that. But all right, so um, and as he's coming down the mountain the second time, he's full of happiness and he's full of the need to speak. I mean, the need to speak is similar to the first time he came down the mountain, right? Like he said, my, you know, my wisdom is like overflowing and I have to pour it out. Um, but the happiness, I guess, is uh, Certainly more emphasized the second time. I didn't even remember if he said it was happy when he came down the mountain the first time. I don't remember anything like that. This time he's like his animals are surprised because he has this blissful expression all of a sudden. Now, um, while he was away, um, two things have happened. The first thing is that his disciples have moved to the blissful isles or the happy isles. So that's where he's going to catch up with them. They're no longer in the pied cow. <laughs> um, uh, I don't think that's ever really explained, but yeah, that's where they are now. So, um, and uh, the other thing that's happened, at least this is what his dream indicates. I guess we're supposed to think that his interpretation of his dream was correct. That, um, right, it, you know, part two starts with him waking up from a dream. Well, I'm not quite, no, but more or less starts with him waking up from a dream. And in the dream, a child was carrying a mirror. And he looked at himself in the mirror and he didn't see himself but rather the sneer and grimace of a devil. So he interprets this to mean that while he's away, his enemies have um, become powerful and uh, have distorted his doctrine or teaching. What's the actual word here? Lera. Yeah, he's teaching Lera. I mean, uh, doctrine is the typical translation of Lera, but because doctrine means teaching. Um, right? So, like, doctor means teacher. I mean, literally means guide or like, don't care is what you do when you like draw an animal. Um, but anyway, so his enemies have just have distorted his doctrine. Now, number one, we don't really know who these enemies are. We didn't really hear anything about his enemies in part one, unless it means the people in the town in the marketplace who didn't like him. But uh, anyway, so his enemies are po are powerful. Um, 
and they've distorted his doctrine. So we think, and then he says, now I'm going to have to go down again. So we think he's going down to clarify his doctrine and rescue it from his enemies. Um, but so, I mean, it seems like he's like on the point of doing that and then something changes, right? Like that's, you know, that's why the animals are amazed. Um, my like the last thing he says before the change is, my friends are lost to me. The hour has come to seek my lost ones. With these words, Zarathustra sprang up, not, however, as if gasping for air, but rather like a seer and a singer whom the spirit has moved. His eagle and his serpent regarded him with amazement, for a dawning happiness lit up his face like the dawn. What has happened to me, my animals, said Zarathustra. Right? So, like, he's on the point of going down to save his doctrine, I guess, by, like, pointing out how his enemies have distorted it. But when he springs up, all of a sudden he's full of a completely different intention, which is not to clarify his doctrine, but to teach something new. This new wisdom that he's built up while he was up the mountain. I don't know. I don't know why it works that way, but I want to point out that that, is, that does seem to be what happens. Um, I mean, like, in a way, it's not surprising because, it, in a way, it would be surprising if Zarathustra sprang up and said, you know, uh, well, it would be surprising from two points of view. First, it would, first of all, it doesn't exactly sound like Zarathustra, that he would go down and carefully, like, you know, drill his disciples to make sure they had his undistorted doctrine or something like that. It doesn't really sound like him. It doesn't really sound like Nietzsche exactly. Uh, um, well, maybe, this might be part of the explanation. Maybe Nietzsche is talking about a type of impulse that he had, right? Like after his early publication, his first impulse was to respond to his critics and show how they had misunderstood him. But instead, he decided to write this, which is no kind of response to, to critics. <laughs> you know, so um, that, uh, but, um, but anyway, it doesn't sound like him. But also, like, um, if we then remember again that he's a fictional character, it would be a weird plot device, right? <laughs> like, because, like, for us, the readers, either the doctrine was explained clearly in part one or it wasn't. So what would be the point of writing part two where he comes down and clarifies it? <laughs> so, okay, so anyway, that's, so that's not what happens, even though it sounds like that's going to happen. At least that's, that's the way I understand it. Um, right, and, um, I mean, I, at least anyway, I think it's pretty clear that what he's going to teach in part two is new and something he didn't say before. And like at the end of that first section, the second section is titled On the Blissful Islands, right? So the first section is about him coming down the mountain. And then the second section, he's already with his disciples in the, in the Blissful Islands. Um, Actually, it doesn't mention that he's with his disciples, but we find out later that they were there. This is kind of a digression, but right at the top of page 111, he says, all that is intransitory, that is but an image, and the poets lie too much. Much later, on page 149, of poets, 
Since I have known the body better, said Zarathustra to one of his disciples, the spirit has been only figuratively spirit to me, and all that is intransitory, that too has been only an image. I heard you say that once before, answered the disciple, and then you added, but the poets lie too much, right? So we know that this disciple on page 149 was there on page 111. <laughs> okay, so, um, but right, but before he gets to that, at the end of the first section, the child with the mirror, he says, my wild wisdom became pregnant upon lonely mountains. Upon rough rocks, she bore her young, her youngest. Now she runs madly through the cruel desert and seeks and, and seeks for the soft grassland, my old wild wisdom. So, right, so what he wants to teach is the youngest, offspring of his wild wisdom. It's not something he already taught before. Um, well, I'm gonna, in a second, I'm going to talk about what he act, what the new thing he actually teaches seems to be. But I just wanted to make one more remark. See, maybe I will use this one. Because he also says, um, so it's a little weird. So Ray, as I pointed out at the very beginning of the book, he leaves this lake, the lake of his home, and he goes up to the mountain. And then, as we know, he comes down. This is like the high cow. And then he goes back up again. And when he comes down this time, he says, there is a lake in me. Um, There is surely a lake in me, a secluded, self-sufficing lake, but my stream of love draws it down with it, draws it down with it to the sea. So now the lake is up here. I mean, you could say, well, that's just a figurative lake, right? Or is it, but this is just a figurative lake too. I mean, <laughs> it's not a real lake. <laughs> but anyway, um, so uh yeah, so now the lake is up here and the water is flowing down. Um, and I guess that is part of the, the meaning of Zarathustra going up and then coming back down. That he's kind of like, you know, gathering potential energy up here so he can earn to flow down. Um, that's, uh, I mean, that's only part of it. There's all there's these other things about the heights, right? That they're dry and cold, as opposed to warm and wet or wet and cold. Um, those are different humors, I guess. Uh, um right like dry cold is, is black bile whereas moist cold is phlegm <laughs> but i don't know if he's thinking of that but in any case um uh there's there's that aspect of the height as well and there's um at some point he, he mixes those two things actually this is in the, the chapter that's called The Rabble, where he says that um, the rabble have polluted all the waters. They polluted all the fountains. And he's had to go up so high that he found the fountains that the rabble haven't drunk from, haven't polluted. And that's the fountain that just fell up. OK, so now it's a fountain. I don't know what that means. <laughs> But like I said, it seems like those metaphors are actually mis mixed somehow. Like 
uh, up is the direction of um, it's the direction of like accumulation, but it's also the direction of purity. Um, and why in both cases, well, of course, I mean, this is a, so like a mountain, uh, like a fountain up here really comes from down here somewhere, I guess. I, I don't know where it's going to come from, but <laughs> like, uh, but I guess, yeah, you could say in both cases it's because it's nearer to the source. You know, like this is where the rain hits first. Um, so, um, and uh, I guess uh, other than this just being a big digression about the, some particular symbols at the beginning of part two, which maybe is mostly what it is, I don't know. But I think, you know, this. The use of this metaphor shows how close Nietzsche really still is to Neoplatonism, and you know, to the kind of picture Emerson and other people have, you know, the one beyond being emanating down. Um, and in fact, uh, Emerson, as you may recall, this is at the you know, the beginning of experience says. We are like millers on the lower levels of a stream when the factories above them have exhausted the water. We too fancy that the upper people must have raised their dams. <laughs> right? So, um, so uh, like Emerson begins experience with us down here saying, hey, where did all the water go? <laughs> We're expecting it to come from up here and it's not coming. Um, is this some kind of response to that? Maybe that's stretching things too far. I don't know. Anyway, it's the same universe of metaphors. So, um, okay. So, so, so that's what he's doing. He's coming down the mountain with this new wisdom that he's accumulated, and he's going to pour it out. And he's really happy to pour it out. And he's very happy throughout, like, I guess, approximately the first half of part two. And at the end of part two, he's very unhappy. <laughs> um, so, um, so the, the heart of the new teaching, presumably, is the thing about the will to power as liberator. Right? The will to power is what frees us. Um, so that's what he says right after he comes down. Again, this is on page 111. Willing liberates. That is the true doctrine of will and freedom. Thus Zarathustra teaches you. Now, I mean, Will to power was actually mentioned once in part one. At least I've written down here in my notes that it was only once, but I didn't go through it again this year. But, um, but um, and on the other hand, there are a lot of things in part two that aren't obviously related to this new doctrine, if it is new, and you could kind of imagine them being put in part one instead. Uh, um, I think probably when I get to those things, I feel like if I think I can imagine them being in part one instead, I'm probably making a mistake. <laughs> I probably just don't understand why you put them there. Um, you know, that's a matter of how much you trust each other, I guess. And it's like a similar issue with Emerson. Also, you get to things in the middle of this essay. You know, could we have said this anywhere? Um, but uh, but uh, so I don't know how to completely use this to set off part two from part one. But I feel like this is a new thing. 
um, or this in, in part two, this is the thing he's coming down to teach. Um, and it's developed most uh, particularly in this section called self overcoming. Um, but like I said, I think that everything in part two kind of centers around this, but it, it seems to come out most explicitly in this section of self overcoming. So, um, the way it's presented there is, um, that life is obeying. Wherever I found living creatures, there too I heard the language of obedience. All living creatures are obeying creatures. Um, um, now, I mean, at first this might seem strange or even uh, self-contradictory or something, right? Like, uh, I mean, it might seem strange because you might say, well, what, like are fleas obeying creatures? You know, they obey, you know, or, you know, uh, and it might seem self-contradictory because it might seem like a barber paradox that would be hanging around here. Right, like you know, uh, um, like doesn't there have to be someone who doesn't obey? <laughs> actually, can you get the button? Let me think. Because actually, because all right, because this is what he says: He who cannot obey himself will be commanded. That doesn't mean to <laughs> Barbara Shea's other one doesn't show themselves. Yeah, no, because it that would be if he said that the commanding one commands everyone who doesn't command themselves. That, but he doesn't say that. He says, yeah, okay. So um uh right. So what he does say is um he who cannot obey himself will be commanded. So that is, every living thing is commanded either by itself or by some other. And then I guess we're supposed to add some other living thing. Um, now, notice this is something that Schelling or Leibniz would completely agree with. Every living thing, well, I mean, Schelling maybe would limit it to an intelligence. Whereas on the other hand, Leibniz wouldn't need the limitation living because according to him, everything is living. <laughs> but uh, but leaving aside that detail, right? That, that every, um, every monad is always obeying some law. It's either obeying the, now, I mean, <clears throat> The way they look at it is, it's really always obeying its own law. Maybe Nietzsche won't agree with that part, but it's but you know, but its own law isn't always explicit to it or something. At least that's the Leibniz version. Schelling version. But so 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 like either it's obeying its own law that it explicitly gives itself or some other monad somewhere else is expressing that law more clearly and it's obeying that. Um, and they agree that um, the extent to which the thing is obeying itself is the extent of its power. So it's will to obey itself rather than others. It's will to power. Um, so, 
So, um, okay, so, um, so therefore, like what Nietzsche is saying there about living things being obeyed things, and that they either have to obey themselves or obey something else, someone else, shouldn't um, a reflection seem that surprising, right? And if you ask who the fleas are obeying, you know, um, I don't know what Nietzsche would say, right? <laughs> uh, they're obeying themselves. Uh, but, um, uh, but I know Leibniz would say that they're obeying themselves to some limited extent because they have some limited amount of clarity. But um, to a large extent, they're not obeying themselves. Or maybe actually there's a there's a sharp cutoff between rational beings and non-rational beings. And it's yeah, maybe that's what he would say. In some sense, the fleas aren't obeying themselves at all because although they do perceive the law clearly, they don't have a concept of it as law the way rational beings do. So uh, I mean all this is important because because you know Nietzsche is not doesn't necessarily want to draw the line where Leibniz or Schelling draws it between intelligence and other living things. I think he's deliberately not doing that by concentrating on life. That's the main issue here. Um, but in any case, this is like, like this view that, uh, that living is about obeying and that you have to obey something. And if you're powerful enough, you can obey yourself. But if you're not, you have to obey something else is like is actually in some sense a kind of standard way of looking at, at life <laughs> um he adds something else to it which um is maybe less clear in all commanding there appear to me to be an experiment and a risk and the living creature always risks itself when it commands. Um, what is the risk? Well, you could think of risk to, you, uh, here's two risks you could think of anyway. One would be, um, the, I should stand every minute. Oh, I know why I'm standing there because my notes are. Oh. So, um, so one way of understanding this risk might be to say, well, there's a risk that I won't be obeyed. So I command. Issuing a command is a risk. The risk is that I won't be obeyed. That, um, I mean, um, That could apply either to commanding others or to commanding myself. Uh, another way of looking at the risk might be that uh, maybe what I've commanded isn't good for me. It's not compatible with my continued life. I've commanded the wrong thing. Um, so if I didn't command and just obeyed someone else, well, I mean, so of course there would still be the risk that what they commanded wasn't good for me but it wouldn't be my fault <laughs> so it wouldn't be my risk so to speak so um in Leibniz at least and I guess also in Schelling these those two risks that I just mentioned go together if I, the first one was the risk of not being obeyed And the second was the risk of commanding wrongly. So in Leibniz, remember, this is Leibniz's explanation of the possibility of sin, that um, 
when I command wrongly, I won't be obeyed. <laughs> uh, um, it's a little actually, maybe that's a little bit of a misleading way of putting it. I mean, um, No, I guess that's right. It's just oh, that way of thinking about sin is always so hard to, to get to your mind because it always seems so backwards, right? But the point is, like, um, if I command what's not really best, even though it seems to be best, then I won't be afraid. <laughs> um, uh, So uh, do the risks go together for Nietzsche too, these two risks? And I think the answer is that they do, but sort of for the opposite reason, or anyway, it's a really different reason. I think the reason is what he says, this is also on page 137. He must become judge and avenger and victim of his own law. That is, the risk I take in commanding is that, um, and so here wrongly means equals, right, I commanded what was not best for me. Now, I mean, in Leibniz, of course, if you add in optimism, then what, you know, that what is best for me is what also what's best for the world, because this is the best of all possible worlds. But forget about that for the moment. It's what's not best for me. So, um, so the risk here is that in commanding, I take on the responsibility of enforcing my command, including against myself. Yeah. So, like, if I compare it to Coleridge's concept of law, that basically I'm taking the law away from the higher power and taking into my own hands. And that comes with me being having to be right because I'm making the law. Uh, yeah. So according to Polish, what we're describing here is original sin. No, that's not exactly right. I didn't think of comparing this with Coleridge. What do you think? No, so I mean, so according to Coleridge, when like no, according to Coleridge, original sin consists in obeying a law that's external to you and regarding it as a law in that sense that someone else is going to enforce against you. Whereas by the you know, um, when your will is infused with grace, <laughs> um, uh, you become yourself the source of. The law, and then you don't relate to it as a law. Um, so I, I think you know if you're going to compare Coleridge to Nietzsche on this, you would have to say that Nietzsche is, is um, wasn't there something like this in Emerson already? I'm not sure, but anyway, that that, that Nietzsche is saying that. Um, Making the law your own law doesn't get rid of the problem that it's, that it's a law. <laughs> you still but, have to obey it. Yeah, like that's what I'm, I think yeah. that's what I'm trying to get to. So that I kind of put myself, I protect myself, I give myself the law. So I am sort of like transcend because, like, and that's why I'm the judge, the jury, and the victim of my own. Of well, the, the judge and the avenger, 
right? That is, I mean, you, well, no. So the thing is, you don't really that like. So here's this picture again, right? Um, and yeah, I don't know how to draw the difference. I just put it out between Coleridge and Nietzsche on this picture, which is worrying. But I can say that um, so it's always, even in Schelling, it's the case that, yes, the infinite self, so to speak, transcends the finite self, but they still are the same self, <laughs> right? So that, you know, um, that's why, like, this limit always has to be overcome because um, the infinite self has to represent itself in this, right? So, um, um, so, but in Nietzsche, like, it's not so much a matter of representing as it is a matter of punishing, <laughs> right? Like, so when you say I've transcended myself and giving myself a command, well, in a sense, yes, but um, if I have to enforce it, I'm going to have to enforce it against myself, the one who gave the command. That's why giving the command was a risk, I think. Um, that is, uh, um, so in other words, the way these things go together is, um, so the way these things went together for Leibniz is basically that if I command wrongly, I won't be obeyed. But the way that things go together for Nietzsche is that if I'm not, if, if it's not obeyed, then it will turn out I commanded wrongly in the sense that I now have to punish myself. Um, um, so, I mean, how is this possible? <laughs> How do we do this? How does the living creature do this? So Zaratustra asks, how has this come about? This is the sentence after the one I just read about becoming judge and avenger and victim. How has this come about? Thus I asked myself. What persuades the living creature to obey and to command and to practice obedience even in commanding? Listen now to my teaching, you wisest men, blah, blah, blah. Where I found a living creature, there I found the will to power. So the, now, as I pointed out, even in Leibniz, we're already talking about will to power in a sense. When I like when I'm trying to command myself, um, I'm trying to uh, to be the you know the clear representation of the law that I have to obey myself, and so God will owe it to me to make it happen rather than to someone else. And in that sense, uh, I'm more powerful. Um, but the thing that's different about the will to power in Nietzsche is that power is now opposed to life. It's different from life. Oops. Sorry. Um.
So he says, you know, a living thing always has a will, not, however, a will to life. I think he he takes that idea that a living thing has a will to life as being wrong for the same reason that he says there's no such thing as a will to existence. The will to existence. This will does not exist. <laughs> that is, in order to have a will to existence, you would have to not exist. So there is no such thing as a will to existence. Well, maybe there's something to be said about that, but in any case, so, um, and uh, I think he would say the same thing about life. So, um, where, but so what he says and said is where life is, there is also will, not will to life, but so I teach you will to power. This is the bottom of page 138. The living creature values many things higher than life itself. Yet out of this evaluation itself speaks the will to power. So power is worth risking life for. So the, so the punishment I inflict on myself may be the death penalty. Um, that's the risk I'm taking there, but it's worth it because I value power more highly than life. Um, I mean, why do I value that more than life? It's, I mean, it's, well, This says farther up the page, I would rather perish than renounce this one thing. And truly, where there is perishing and the falling of leaves, behold, their life sacrifices itself for the sake of power. I think the point is that like what I want in this is something like this, that if if I'm gonna succumb, if I'm gonna go under. I want it to be according to my will. That's the power I want. So, um, so I would rather have that than continue in life not according to my will. So that's why I take the risk of commanding if I do. Yeah. So it's stuck on to life. What is it? What well, is? Like going under into is it is it life that he is going into and he would rather have it his own way than someone else's like instilled way into him. This life is what is he going under into? I guess. Oh well, no, I mean, oh, well, I mean that's a good question because I so I was thinking of going under as just meaning perish. Right. In fact, I I assume that's actually a good question. What does it say here in German? Um, I would rather perish. Um, Yeah, lieber noch gehe ich unter. I would rather perish. That is literally, I would rather go on. Right. So, um, yeah, so I was thinking of go under as just meaning perish or succumb, is the way it's sometimes translated into English when they're trying to, because succumb also, I guess, literally, we don't really hear this in English. 
I literally was about to go on. Right? But so, uh, but of course, we know, like from the beginning of the book, that there's always this thing about Zarathustra uh, going under into something, not just perishing. Um, So in other words, it sh I should be able to draw in this picture somehow. Um, I mean, of course, when he goes down or goes under, he is pouring out his wisdom. He's using it up. He's expending his power. Uh, So in that sense, the two things are related to each other, but uh, it's not clear on the face of it how that's related to this thing about commanding and punishing yourself. I mean, So we do know, I mean, this comes up though more towards the end of part two. When he's like on his starting on his way out again, I guess. Although it actually gets more complicated. But anyway, like towards, towards the end of part two, um, he's uh There's something he's commanding himself to say, but he, but he, he won't do it. There's this, there's, right? There's something, I mean, assuming that this voice that speaks unto him without, or this uh, words that are spoken to him without voice are, really, are him commanding himself, right? So he's like, he's commanding himself to, to speak a certain truth. And he's responding, no, I won't. Um, but I mean, the thing that's weird about that is that that's kind of that's not a privilege of going down, it's a privilege of going back up. <laughs> uh, well, I guess it's not surprising that there's some things about this I don't understand. I think it's actually more surprising that there's any things about it that I do understand. <laughs> So I guess I'll just have to leave that um, those pieces not tied together in a moment, but maybe I'll think of more later. Um, um, so, I mean, this also helps explain, I mean, I said that all of this was going to, was going to, be a matter of, of getting this out explicitly. Um, right, the will to power is the liberator because uh, the will to power is um, taking command of myself and not obeying someone else. Now, um, again, when I put it in that abstract way, it's not new to Nietzsche. A lot of people say something like this. Not just Leibniz and Schelling, but Descartes and Spinoza, Kant, right, that, uh, um, well, as he puts it, so this is a little bit longer version on page 111 of Oops. Well, it's the liberator. Um, 
All feeling suffers in me and is in prison, but my willing always comes to me as my liberator and bringer of joy. Right? So feeling, um, like uh, passion is passive. We're following someone else's law. The will is pathological as conflict. Where pathological means passive, right? Um, that is right because Asya in this context translate, translates Greek process. So uh, Kant actually has a systematic tendency to, to substitute Greek terminology for Latin terminology. I'm not sure why he does that. Oh, so yeah, so pathological is Kant's way of saying passive. Right, so like, um, as long as the will, as long as we're under the control of feeling or passion, it's someone else's law is determining what we're going to do. But the will is active. So, um, so when the will is in control, <laughs> then we're free because then we're the source. Yeah. So question. You say describing how things are, as in like everyone has a will to power, and that is the that is a chance to liberate someone, or is this like a prescriptive, like ethical teaching that you should do this <laughs> and then you'll be liberated? Right. So I mean, well, whether it's ethical is 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 maybe a different question, but is it prescriptive? Well, he does prescribe, right? I mean, he does say, this is what I tell you to do, you know, stuff like that sometimes to his disciples. Um, uh, but of course, there's something weird about that. So, like, if you wrote a book about Kant, you know, Kant sits, sat in his house in Königsberg for, you know, years and years, and one morning he grows up and says, I have a teaching that I want, right? So, and like he goes out to his disciples. So would he command them to do this, that, and the other thing? He would not, <laughs> right? Because if they do it because he's commanding it, then it has no moral worth. They have to do it, they have to give themselves the law. So now, but Zaratustra is doing that. <laughs> he comes down to the mountain and says, my disciples, I tell you, command yourselves. <laughs> so, uh, um, So it's prescriptive, but it's a kind of prescription that you can't exactly follow. <laughs> um, and, you know, I mean, his disciples, again, like I pointed this out when I talk about part one, that when he leaves the, or no, I guess it's when he wakes up under the hollow tree and he has his like epiphany, you know, he says, oh, what I need is comrades. I need friends who will co-create with me or whatever. But he doesn't really get that. Sometimes he calls them friends, but they're, they're disciples. And whenever you actually, so I mean, most of the time you just hear him talking and you have to assume that his disciples are there. But um, whenever you act, there's an actual interaction between him and his disciples, it's a little uneasy. Right? Like they don't say exactly what he wants them to. Um, so, uh, so I think, I mean, I know I'm not exactly answering your question because your, your question like assumes a certain distinction between descriptive and prescriptive and that we can fit this into a fit of it. But I, but, uh, but first of all, I'm not that proud of that distinction in general, and, but I'm not 
convinced that Nietzsche is interested in it at all, you know, as opposed to Kant and say, so is it descriptive or prescriptive? It's, you know, he's telling you something, it's supposed to have an effect. Um, uh, he wants it to have an effect. He's come down. He's so happy to pour it out. He wants it to have some kind of effect, but uh, it couldn't literally have that effect by prescribing to you. Is it something that maybe is the state of affairs you just have to be realized in the public? It's so the disciples, and the by the way, in the end, the disciples kind of disappear. I mean, doesn't I might be getting confused about this? I think he doesn't even come back to them at the end of part three. In part four, he certainly he ends up back on top of the mountain at the end of part four with all these other people. There's like lots of guests in his cave at the end, but they're not his disciples. They're all kind of other weird people, the magician, Pope, I mean, uh, <laughs> so, uh, um, so, I mean, I guess the question is, like, well, okay, what about us and Nietzsche? You know, why is it? Because, like, Zarathustra is, is not real, and the disciples are not real. Why is Nietzsche telling us this story? Um, so, does Nietzsche tell us you should do this, you should do that? He doesn't. Does he expect us to be his disciples? Does he want that? He doesn't portray it in a very good light, right? So what does he want? And you know, as I that was the, like the first thing I pointed out about trying to understand Nietzsche. And I mean, it's definitely worse in this book than it is in the earlier Nietzsche that we read. That like, but it's already I think it's already present there too, and even in Emerson that you're like you're not sure why he's saying this to you. That. When if you ask whether it's descriptive or prescriptive, you're offering two theories of why he would say something to you. One is to get you to believe something true, and the other is to get you to do something that he's, you know, exhorting you to do. But probably he's not doing either of those. He's doing something else. <laughs> so, um, so, but I think, you know, the best that can be said about it is that, and this is true of, I almost think, I've almost thought in the past that this could be a criterion of, of the philosophical interest of the work. If, it's, if you find that you're having trouble understanding it, and then you realize that the work is talking about the trouble you're having understanding it. <laughs> that's, I, that's, you know, if you understand that much, you can't understand what it's saying necessarily about that trouble, right? So, I mean, Nietzsche is like well aware that, that he's presenting us with, with a text that we don't know what to do with. And he's what well, you can tell he's well aware because the you know the story is all about a teacher and the disciples and how it doesn't work out and he keeps coming to them and leaving and coming and leaving. <laughs> um, and it's not clear he succeeds with them in the end. And um, I mean, you know, as with Plato Socrates, same thing for the same reason. I, I think. Uh, um, you know, over and over, we see Socrates teaching or not teaching. He says he doesn't teach. It looks like he's teaching, <laughs> but it's not clear that anyone actually learns anything. 
Right. So, yeah, I know I know all of that doesn't really answer your question, but I guess I'm trying to explain why it's you know the problem is how to find the right question to ask here. <laughs> um. So, okay, but what I was starting to say now, six twenty six. Um. This is not that bad. Um, right, so what I was starting to say was that, um, so the idea that the will is the liberator Forget about will to power for a second. <laughs> the idea that the will is the liberator is um, is not new in Nietzsche. As I said, like the will is an active faculty, and therefore, when um, the will determines itself, it's we're acting freely. Um, so you know. Whether that's the same as the intellect, which is also an active faculty, or whether they're different, um, it depends if you're asking Spinoza or Kant, or, you know. But, but that basic idea. So, um, um, but there's something really different about it. <laughs> um, And I think it has to do with what I was just talking about, at the risk. And that's why this is a will to power. Um, but, you know, uh, so in Kant, when the, when the will conflicts with the inclinations, which are, are passive, it's like the, conflict is between the universal law and my private interests. And um, right, so it's like the rational versus the irrational. And so therefore, like I couldn't be the judge and avenger and victim in my own case. Because the whole problem is that I'm trying to act in my own private interest, so I'm not a competent judge in this case. <laughs> that's um, and that's why, according to Kant, although we're in the kingdom of ends, we're all legislators. Leg legislators, only God is the executive in the kingdom of ends. That's the way he sets it up in terms of like it's basically like translating Rousseau's political theory into the numinal realm. <laughs> so, right, so in, so in the kingdom of ends, we're all legislators, we all give the law, we all give the same law, because we all give it in our capacity as pure wills. Um, but when it comes to enforcing it, we can't do that. So God does that. Um, And I guess Nietzsche's response to that is what he says on page 110. God is a supposition, but I want your supposing to reach no further than your creating will. Could you create a God? And then there's a dash where I guess you're supposed to think no. <laughs> so could you create a God? So be silent about all gods but you could surely create the Superman, right? So, um, that is, um, I can delegate the Superman to be the Avenger of my law because I can create the Superman. But I couldn't do that with God because I can't create God. 
right? It's like they can't will God to exist because they already um, so um, so the will to and the Superman will avenge my law by overcoming me and making me go under. So um, so uh, the will to power is also the will to create beyond myself. It's the will to create an avenger. And that's the way I avoid having to, I don't know if this is the right, this maybe seems like the wrong end to go in, so to speak. But uh, anyway, these things go together that uh, I don't need another world, a back world, and a God in it, a kingdom of ends, to do this. I do this right here in this world by willing to create the Superman, the over man. Um, and again, like that, so the overman is somehow. So I guess this is a this is maybe a different answer to the question you, that you asked a long time ago, Barnabas. That like, do I transcend myself? Yes, I overcome myself. The whole title of the section is self overcoming, but I don't transcend myself by going to some mystic, you know, numinal realm or something like that. I transcend myself by creating my successor. So I never become God then, in, according to this. When I would be God of Earth or something. Well, it's so, I mean, definitely not, although we haven't yet, yet got to the real, right? Because if, like, the will to power is the main point of part two, that the eternal recurrence is going to be the main part of part three. So, like, uh, um, so we haven't really got to the reason why this this means I can't be God at all yet. I mean, you might think that in the end I sort of am because there's going to be an infinite process of self overcoming when I'm at the beginning of it. Um, This is an objection that Descartes answers, proposes an answer from the third meditation. Perhaps I will have all these perfections of which I have the idea eventually. So why is that objection not with the other person? I don't know, but anyway, it doesn't matter because that's not what Nietzsche's been saying. Um, I mean, that is sort of what Leibniz says. Of course, he wouldn't put it by saying that every monad eventually becomes God. Because for one thing, I mean, they don't. It's an infinite process. They never become double. Uh, but they do get better and better. <laughs> so um, it's just that they have infinitely far to go, so they never get there. Um, So, um, so that's how I think all of these pieces go together. The, the will to power is the liberator because um, um, not because it frees me from my private interests in order to follow some universal interest or something like that, but because it um, prompts me to take the risk of creating my successor. And here again, like whether the it's it's the will to the risk that matters. Right? Like whether the Superman is ever going to come or not, maybe doesn't make that much difference. 
what matters is that we're capable of willing it now, as opposed to we can't will God to exist now. Um, okay, so this might be a good place to um, talk about. And there is enough time for it, so it's definitely a good place to talk about um, what might be called Nietzsche's atheism and materialism. So, I mean, so for like uh, a long, long time, all philosophers tried to explain why whatever their doctrine was, it was not properly called atheism or materialism, <laughs> including even Spinoza, who said all so many things that you're not supposed to say. <laughs> uh, didn't say that, although other people said it about him. Um, so, uh, whereas, Nietzsche obviously now I mean not that Nietzsche is literally the first but uh, it's surprising I think even at this point for someone should I say that it's certainly surprising for someone coming out of I mean, I pointed out that Schelling is, as opposed to, you know, sh like Schelling does not have that much role for God in this system, at least in the system of transcendental idealism. God does come in at some point. We didn't even read that part, but um, so I don't know. Maybe I'm making too much of a big deal of this, but in any case, it is, it, it, it is. Well, I mean, this is related to what I'm about to say about what this means. It, you know, the context for it is a context where it's somewhat shocking and surprising to say, um, you know, my philosophy is atheist and materialist. And um, so one thing that means is that this shouldn't be understood as something like this. Like, um, I mean, this, here's a form of atheism and or, and or materialism, both, I guess, where you say, look, of course, every normal person only believes in the existence of the normal world of like natural things. Give me one reason to believe in anything else. So, like for example, the flying spaghetti monster. Right? I mean, that's the rhetorical function of the flying spaghetti monster. Where you say, like, if we're going to start believing in arbitrary, weird things, why not this flying spaghetti monster? Right? Like, we know every normal person just believes in normal things, but, you know, now you're telling me to believe in this other weird thing? Well, I say flying spaghetti monster. Right? So, I mean, that's not the context that Nietzsche is talking in. And, um, 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 and that's not what he thinks, right? Like, that's not how he thinks that people will react. To him. Um, oh, 
Um, but, you know, so instead of that, you could be in something like this. Of course, we all start off believing in something supernatural, right? Like, it's natural to start off believing in something supernatural. You know, so a lot of philosophers, like Hobbes, for example, who presumably, although he also denies it, actually is an atheist. Um, you know, nevertheless, we'll give a little natural history of religion. You know, I think Spinoza, wait, that's the book that's called Natural History of Religion is. Anyway, that's <laughs> not a book by Hobbes. But anyway, like gives a little natural history of religion, explaining why it's natural for human beings to have these supernatural beliefs. And but but and then you know what would come after that explanation is something like, um, um, however, as we get wiser, we can learn to subtract those supernatural beliefs off. They're unnecessary. They were not properly found in experience. Whatever, something like that. Um, so, um, this is not from this book. This quote. This is from Schopenhauer's Educator. Um, where he says about the philosophers, lately they have been content to assert that they are really no more than the frontier guards and spies of the sciences. <laughs> right? So, like that would, I think that's an expression of this kind of approach that I was giving a second, where it's like, okay, the role of philosophers here, yeah, we don't have a special realm of supernatural things to tell you about or anything like that. We're just here to enforce naturalism, right? To uh, like teach you how to not believe. I, I think that's what he means there by frontier guards and spies of the sciences. To teach you how to not believe any of these superfluous things that interfere with the sciences. So, um, um, that doesn't sound like what Nietzsche is doing either. That's he describes these philosophers as doing it. It's part of his description of university philosophy. How uh, it's got so little left to do <laughs> that they end up just doing this thing, where, you know, where they spy out for the sciences. So I think you know neither of those are really an explanation for what's going on here. Um, I mean, I think what's really happening here is that Nietzsche thinks that, so I mean, like, I guess one theme in this course and one theme of 19th century philosophy has been about the paradoxes, theoretical and practical, that are involved in trying to give a finite representation of the infinite. Um, and I think Nietzsche's attitude is that the paradoxes are real. <laughs> there really is a problem, but the problem is that the Christian slash Neoplatonic slash German idealism and he, like runs those all together, basically. Um, solution is not sufficient. So, I mean, I think, you know, that's what he really means when he says he's an atheist and a materialist, right? In other words, he doesn't mean that either that the world is perfectly fine and there's no reason to add some arbitrary stuff to it, or that um, the world will be perfectly fine if you can just manage to get rid of all the superfluous superstitions. <laughs> the world is not fine. <laughs> It really is, right? Like we really are faced with this kind of impossible problem. It's just that um, that uh, positing a god or spirit or something like that is 
not addressing the problem. <laughs> so yeah. would that apply to the infinite part of the set as well? Like well, it's, you know, so it depends what you mean by infinite, but I mean, and remember, even though I, I always draw this line as infinite, you know, so maybe like, I mean, remember, sometimes when you draw, when I draw the picture, it goes like this in the end, right? In other words, this isn't infinite because it's infinitely long. It's infinite because it's prior to limitation. Um, so, uh, so it's not like, um, it's not like in order to believe in this paradox, you have to believe in something that's infinitely big. That God is really, really big. <laughs> I mean, that's not even right. That is, that's not even right of traditional philosophical accounts of God, right? God isn't really, really big. God doesn't have size. God is, right, absolutely simple. <laughs> you know, so what? God is infinitely powerful. So that's, you know, that's what I want. And the question is, and not only, not only is that what I want, but I want that. I want that because it's necessary in order to want anything, right? Because I will that a certain kind of infinite power, a power that's self-determining and not determined by something else, because without that, I'm not really willing. That's that's the practical version of the paradox. So does Nietzsche like deny that or just says the paradox is wrongly instituted? Or... Well, so he's gonna say that you can't that, that, that this that well sorry, I'm pointing the opposite of this, right? Is um doesn't work because it's actually a manifestation of weakness. So it undermines itself. It's not so, um, um, that, um, so, I mean, this is the part he's talking about. So in Hongdale's translation, it's called the afterworld. But so after, so I think actually, uh, Hongyo actually has a footnote where he explains for once why he's translating this way. He thinks that the after world's men are people who believe in the afterworld. Um, um, But I mean, first of all, I think if it was really about the afterlife, this would be not. But it's not, it's Hinter. So, like, Hinter I mean, means behind, basically. Yeah. I mean, it could, so in some context, it could be right to translate it as after. In context, we're like behind and after are the same thing, essentially, right? But it doesn't mean like after. After life, that would, you know, so, um, so that's why, like, other people, I didn't check how Kaufman translates it. I know Common translates it backwards, which, which also brings out the pun that is there in the German. That, that it sounds like back with woodsman, <laughs> right? He's saying back worldsman. Back worldsman believe in a kind of back world. So what does that mean? I think it means like a like a world kind of behind the scenes, 
where you go around this world, <laughs> you're getting back of it. Um, you know, there, so in other words, that's why I'm saying that the problem is that it doesn't actually confront the problem. Um, so, um, I mean, I guess there's two ways of, of seeing why he thinks it doesn't confront the problem. Oh, now I have three minutes left. So, yeah, I guess I'll just say in part one, it sounds kind of like the issue is that, and this is kind of what I was just saying, it's like, it's too fast, it's too easy, it's lazy, it's a sign of weakness. You can't solve this problem, which is a problem about how to be powerful by, um, by this kind of weariness or weakness. Right? This is what he says on page 59. Um, weariness, which wants to reach the ultimate with a single leap, with a death leap, a poor, ignorant weariness, which no longer wants even to want. That created all gods and afterwards. Right? So it can't solve the problem because it's not trying to take control of my life. It's trying to put the control somewhere else in the back world. Um, in part two, maybe this is the same thing, but he puts it a little bit differently. If there were gods, how could I endure not to be a god? Therefore, there are no gods. <laughs> right? That, like, I mean, that. It's not a formally valid argument, so to speak, right? But it is a good argument if you realize what the problem situation is, right? The, like, um, I'm trying to understand how I can be completely, how I can be free. Free enough for what? Free enough to want to be free. That's, so that's, it's like infinite power but it's also kind of like the minimum power that you can have, I have any power. That's, that's what I want. How can I do that by positing the existence of a being that I can't create? Right. So, um, so, so that's what, that's how we get to this. It's not like, um, commonsensical. It's the opposite. Really. It's, it's basically like it's, it's supposed to be harder and stranger than, than the alternative. Um, okay, now I was going to do a little transition to the eternal recurrence. I guess I'll just say one thing about the eternal recurrence, which is that um, like so towards the end of part two, when Zarathustra becomes so unhappy, it's, somehow his unhappiness is tied to this thing that he won't say, right? Not the hunchback even really, like the hunchback is like, why do you say one thing to your disciples and another thing to yourself, Zarathustra, right? So like, but, but the thing that he won't say, or he only he starts to say at the very end of part two is that, the problem for the will to power as liberator is that sure enough, I can will whatever's coming in the future, but what about the past? It's already over, I can't will it. So he says the past is a prison that keeps even the will to power from being free. Yeah, so like the eternal occurrence is gonna be the solution to that. In the sense that I can will the past because I will it to come again, right? Um, but uh, but it's also going to be a problem. 
this is why Zaratustra doesn't want to say it. Because if you thought that this process of self-overcoming was just going to keep on going infinitely and I was going to get better and better, that's not consistent with the eternal return. Right? Somehow I have to get back to the previous state. So somehow in the future, I'm willing myself to be like un-self-overcome. That's that's what that's what Zarathustra is like holding back. Okay, we'll talk more about that on Thursday and uh, sometimes.